so much for wonderful singing and piano playing. It was fun, wasn't it? It was fun. <laughs> so, what an amazing song that is, too. It is amazing grace, isn't it? And you think about what we talked about with um, in Hebrews and, and all of these heroes of the faith sort of down watching us um, as we run this race. And then when that race is concluded, we'll be in his presence, we'll be in their presence, and every day we will worship the Lord. What an amazing thing. All right. So thank you for having me. As I mentioned, um, many of our, uh, many of our uh, folks are down in Raleigh, and many of our folks are down in Raleigh uh, at the National Conference, and uh, so I am even more thankful for you all being here, um, not taking the opportunity, as it were, when so many people are gone, to also be gone. <laughs> so thank you for being here, for not uh, neglecting the gathering together of believers as it were. Um, I like to mock Pastor Daniel from time to time uh, because of his commitment to the book of Luke since he arrived here at Zephyr Hills a few years ago. But uh, here we are again. Uh, I think this is my third time preaching and my second time where I will be preaching from the book of Luke. So uh, perhaps it's true that we become the things that we mock. So I'll owe him an apology when he returns. If you wouldn't mind opening your Bibles now to the book of Luke, uh, and that's going to be Luke chapter 22, uh, verses 1 through 6. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him, that is Jesus, to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan, Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and offered an officer's how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. So what is the context here at essentially the jumping point for the plot to capture and kill Jesus? It takes place near in time to the Passover. What is the Passover? Passover is the feast that is held in honor of the Jews' escape from Egypt, whereby they were protected from the destroyer by marking their homes with lamb's blood. So it's an important holiday in the lives of the Jews, and typically Many, many individuals would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It's not just important, it's a command. Exodus 13, 3, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength the hand of the Lord brought you out from this place. So God commands them to honor this holiday. So keep in mind also that at this time, Jesus had entered into the city already. And if you recall, he entered to great fanfare. He's preaching. The number of followers is growing. And so the priests uh, were afraid. They wanted Jesus dead. They wanted this. Whatever it was ended. But they were afraid. They were afraid because of the multitude of people. They were concerned that if they were to capture Jesus in the open, that there would be a riot. Uh, and what that riot would do at that point would bring down the Romans on them, and then they would be finished. 
So they're afraid of the people. They're afraid of the Romans. They're trying to figure out a way that they can, they can end this uh, and do so discreetly. So enters Judas, as we see in verse 4, to confer with the priests as they are trying to figure out what to do. So who was Judas? Well, he was one of the 12. Hopefully we know that. He's one of the 12. As with the other disciples, he was selected by Jesus after much prayer. Luke 6, 12 through 15 says, In these days he went out, he being Jesus, to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So we see Jesus prayed all night to select these individuals, among whom was Judas. He was also the only Judean. The rest of the men were from Galilee. He was close to Jesus. Psalm 41 prophesied that Judas would be both trusted and a friend. He was so close at the Last Supper so as to dip his bread into the same cup as Christ during that meal. He was also not an innocent man. He was not perfect, as they would say. In the previous chapters, you see the story of Mary and Martha, and as Martha poured out the perfume onto Jesus' feet, Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas was a thief. He was close to God. He was selected by God after much prayer. He was also a thief. Furthermore, Jesus knew that Judas would be the one to betray him. John 6, again, we're going back a lot to John, actually. Jesus answered them, Did not I choose you, the twelve? And that one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So he was a disciple. He was close to the Lord. He was a thief. Jesus knew he was his betrayer. So what do we take away from this? Hopefully three things. One, spiritual warfare is a real thing. And those that are close to Jesus are not free from it. There's danger. Number two, there are casualties in this spiritual war, but there are no victims. And number three, believers must understand that they, you, I, are in the battle, and we must act accordingly. Next slide. Perfect. Oop. Too much at once here. So point number one, spiritual warfare is real. Furthermore, it's ongoing. And the closer we get to the Lord, the more danger there is. Hopefully none of us here today would be so flippant as to say we do not believe spiritual warfare is real. But let's go through it nonetheless. Jesus himself references an army of unseen angels in Matthew chapter 26. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? Ephesians chapter 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There are a myriad of other references. We read some again in Hebrews. There are a myriad of references that describe these angels and then these demons and this great battle that goes on around us. If yet unseen, there are numerous references to angels that are constantly at our side protecting us. In this battle, Satan himself is the chief antagonist. Scripture tells us that he roams the earth like a prowling lion seeking to destroy. Now, look at verse 3 again. It's not very, uh, not a long piece of scripture there, but look at verse 3. What does it say? It says that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was the number, who was of the number of the twelve. So Jesus, Judas was close to Jesus. He was not an outsider, He was not somebody on the outside looking in. He had a seat at the table. He was close to the very God in flesh. He was a trusted friend. Surely there were angels, right? Think a little more. He witnessed the miracles. This is someone who saw it, who participated in the miracles. Jesus helped feed the five, Judas helped feed the 5,000. He was given the power to heal. He must have understood what was at stake. And yet he chose against the, good, the Lord anyway. He witnessed things that we can only fathom, and he chose to betray Jesus Christ. If spiritual warfare is what we think it is, if it is in fact a life or death struggle for our souls, then the closer we get to Jesus, the more intense the fighting must be. Isn't that our goal, though? To be nearer to Jesus, didn't we just talk about that again in Sunday school? How that as we mature as Christians, we should become more like him. Our relationship should be closer to him. That's where the fight is the hardest. As we approach the sun, think in your own lives. Our temptation's not the hardest in the moments where we are growing in our faith. As the devil sees us, slipping from his grasp, I think perhaps he pulls out all the stops and he challenges us just that much more. As our sins are laid bare and our shame is exposed at the cross, is there not temptation at that point to say, if maybe I just change a little, maybe my sin isn't so bad But woe to us, as it was to Judas, because those small sins turn into betrayal. Judas was a thief. He became a rebel. He became the chief betrayer of Christ. How many people have we seen outside of scripture. How many people in recent history can you think of that came crashing down as Judas did? How many leaders in the church must we see crumble before temptation, before we ourselves take the battle seriously? If Satan can influence Judas, if Satan can influence people who have spent their entire lives professing the gospel of Christ, how much more can he influence us? We know Jesus has come. We know that the victory ultimately is secure, but the battles are ongoing. It isn't done yet. And if we're doing things the right way, if we are, in fact, running the race, as we saw in Hebrews 12, then we are on the front lines. 
we are taking fire. Bullets are flying. We're in the way. We have to recognize that. It's going to bring me to my second point. If spiritual warfare is real, if we do indeed battle against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, then we must know there will be casualties. In any war, there are casualties. People die. People are wounded. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, and he chose him anyway. He knew he would be tempted by Satan, and that he would lose. So what do we do with that? How do we figure that out? Does that make Judas a victim of some sort? We already kind of said no, right? But, but bear with me. Does that make Judas a victim? Was he sort of caught up in this grand scheme? Where was God? Was this orchestrated beyond Judas's will? No. Let me say that now. No. Judas had a will. Did he not? He made a choice. God was there the whole time time. He even warned Judas at the Last Supper, uh, and, and you'll see in John 13, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. That disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is him whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. We see again, Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do it quickly. Judas again is warned. You will betray me. He knew what had just happened. He knew now that Jesus knew. And what do we do? He does it anyway. He wasn't a victim. But he was, in fact, a casualty. In the spiritual battle, there are casualties. There are people who choose. And who choose hell but they do so willingly. John 3.16, Whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The key word there being believe. James 4, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When we submit our lives to Christ, most certainly we put ourselves in the line of fire. We've also got the God of hosts defending us. He doesn't abandon us. It is by choice that we abandon him. Does it bother anyone that someone so close to the Lord would refuse? Maybe we say to ourselves, if I had doubt, if I have doubt, if I witnessed these miracles, if I saw Jesus in the flesh, No way. I would believe, I would continue to believe that doubt would be vanquished. What does sin do to our lives, though? It's disorienting, is it not? It causes us not to trust the things that we see and we hear. Sin caused Judas to reject God when he was standing next to him. When we give in to the temptation of sin, we allow ourselves to be weak. Our discernment is diminished. Our defenses are down, and we open the door for the devil to enter into our lives and wreak havoc as it did, as he did in Judas.
think about our world today. Think about the people who forsake the physical features of their own birth for the sake of sin. Up is down, left is right. Sin disorients you. You cannot see clearly when embattled in it. And woe be to those who allow it to happen. Matthew 26 says, The Son of Man goes, that is, is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Woe to us when we choose sin. Woe to us when we become the betrayers of Christ. Moving on to my third point. We have a choice to make. We must choose to engage or that choice will be made for us. Judas chose to betray Jesus. He could have chosen not to. But those are the only two choices to be made. There isn't anything else. You are for Christ or you are against him. The battle is at our doorsteps now. And we have to make that same choice. So how do we choose? How do we choose God? Is it enough to pray a prayer and be done. No. No. (laughs) We have to train daily. We have to train daily. We have to fight daily. That choice is one that is made repeatedly. Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Skipping down to 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace and in all circumstances take up the shield of faith which you, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Not all of those pieces of armor are defensive, by the way. A sword, although possibly defensive, is an offensive weapon. Although I guess I would really use my left hand, I'm left-handed. The word of God, we know, is sharper than a two-edged sword. What is it used for? It is used to strike down the enemy. We put on this suit of armor. We come to church. Do we just sit? All right, devil, come and get me. I got my armor on. No. No right? Why does he give us a sword? To attack, to engage. It isn't enough to be defensive. It isn't enough. We lose the fight when we do that. He has asked us to be warriors. When we share the word of God, we slay the devil. And you know what else we do? We get a bigger army. Right? Isn't that fantastic? In what 
world do you go out, you attack somebody with a sword, your army gets bigger. That's what happens. Our army gets bigger. So we put on our armor, and we go, and we make disciples. We choose God, but we do so every day, and we must do so every day if we stand a chance. If we're lazy with our orders, if we're unscrupulous in our dealings, if we deny truth, then when that day arrives, we will be lost. I was trying to think of some sort of illustration. In fact, my note here says illustration. Well, I had a lot of military imagery here, but you know, what illustration wouldn't either be too cumbersome, too obscure, or just too violent? So we're going to pivot here for a moment. When we give in to the devil as Judas did, would we not call that a catastrophe? Some sort of massive failing. I keep saying we have to put on this armor daily. We have to be diligent. We have to snuff out sin before it consumes us. So we all know the little submarine that was trying to get to the Titanic and all of the people died. So we've been seeing that on the news and we've been sort of talking about it at home and different things and started to think about the Titanic. Why did it crash? Why were so many people killed? Was it a mistake? Was it some massive catastrophe that no one saw coming? And the answer is that most Historians agree that there was a multitude of things that led to that. And if you think about through history, the major, what we would again, I'm using the same word over and over, which you really shouldn't do, but catastrophe, okay? It isn't usually one thing. It's a series of small mistakes that are compounded and compounded and compounded until finally something bad happens, right? So, the ship was going too fast. That's a, we know that. That's a fact. The ship was going too fast. The captain was perhaps trying to beat a previous um, transatlantic record. The lookouts did not have binoculars because the cabinet where they were locked, no one had a key to it. Silly. The hull, the rivets that were placed into the hull were done so sloppily trying to save costs, they were trying to move too quickly, and the rivets were not put in right. In the, the critical moment when the order was given to turn, I believe it was starboard, it's very likely that someone in that chain misheard the order and momentarily turned the ship towards the iceberg before correcting, which I think starboard's this way, yes. There weren't enough lifeboats. The lifeboats weren't filled to capacity because the officers on the ship were given no training on to their capacity and were afraid that those lifeboats would sink if overfilled. What was the result? A ship sunk and 1,500 people died. They didn't just hit an iceberg. They did a lot of little things along the way to make that happen. Isn't that how sin works? You don't just... Come to your pastor one day and you say, you'll never believe what happened. I mean, you might, but you'd be lying to yourself. Because the truth is, sin starts small, and it builds, and it grows, and it takes root, and it destroys, and it gets under the armor. And now you can't pick up the sword. Now you can't put the helmet on. Now the shield is too heavy to lift. And Satan enters into your life, and you betray Christ.
Now, do we sin? Yes, <laughs> right? Sin is a reality. We all do it. Except for me, of course. Oh, yes, we all do it. Sin, sin is, it is a thing that we do, and we cannot help it. Even Peter, right? Denied Christ a short while in our text. But when our hearts are far from the Lord, when we're not focused, when we're not diligent, those sins grow. When we're not doing what we must do daily, that's when sin takes hold. When we're not exercising our spiritual muscles in preparation for the battle, it builds, it silences the spirit, and it opens the door for Satan and subsequently catastrophe. But thanks to God for giving us protection. Thanks to the Lord for giving us his word for allowing us to be close to him. We know the battle will be intense. We know that there will be attempts at our lives from the evil one, but we also know that we have the Lord next to us and we have the armor that was created by him, the holy God, to put on. so that we may prevail. Have you put on the armor recently? Do you have the armor? Have you submitted your life to Christ? And if you have, are you doing it daily over again? The battle's real, and you are in it. You're in it. Are you going to be a casualty? No. Woe be to those. We pray not. We have the Lord to share our burden if you reach out your hand to him. I pray you do. If you want to speak after the service, that's all I got. If you want to speak after the service, I'm happy to do so. If not, if you're like, I don't want to talk to this guy, I'm sure that Brother Daniel would be more than happy to speak with you next week when he's back. I know this was sort of a, perhaps a doom and gloom <laughs> message. Comes with the territory of expositional preaching. It's just the next scripture. But I have, and I do hope that you have gained something from it. And I pray that as we go forward throughout this week, that each one of us makes the choice to put on that armor, pick up the sword, and go to war against the sin in your own lives. And if we do so, we will be victorious. All right. <laughs>